Hi, my name is Maurice Ekwong. Imagine a world where you can fax or email your favorite delicacy from Lagos to Khartoum, from Freetown, Sierra Leone to Addis Ababa, and have your friends and family print a tree a full three or four course meal on a 3d printer although it sounds as something right out of a sci-fi movie this unbelievable feat may be achieved by the convergence of science agribusiness and entrepreneurship within this decade. Today, we spotlight the impact of the growing plant-based and lab-grown food movement on African agriculture in this video. Now, I'll be speaking from the works of Martin Cohen, a visiting research fellow in philosophy with the University of Hertfordshire, Frederick Leroy, Professor of Food Science and Biotechnology from the Vrije Université of Brussels, and Toby Amado Amido, a dietitian, nutritionist, and blogger. Now, let's start by saying that we shouldn't believe everything that we see in the popular media. If you were to believe newspapers, social media, or TV, you'd probably think that doctors and nutritionists are the people guiding us through the ticket of what to believe when it comes to food. But food trends are far more political than we can imagine, and mostly economically motivated. From ancient Rome, where the provision of bread to citizens was a central measure of good government, to 18th century Britain, where the economist Adam Smith identified a clear link between wages and price of corn, food has been at the epicenter of the economy of nations. Politicians have long had their eye on food policy as a way to shape society. Now, what is the objective of tariffs, control of food policy? Tariffs essentially and other trade restrictions on imported food and grain were enforced in 17th century Britain. These corn laws enhanced the profits and political power of landowners at the cost of raising food prices and hampering growth in other economic sectors. In Ireland, the ease of growing the recently imported potato at the time led to most people living off a narrow and repetitive diet of homegrown potato with a dash of milk. When potato blight struck, over a million people starved to death, even as the country continued to produce large amounts of food Guess what? For exports to England. This is 17th century Ireland. During the colonial um, um, reign in India, 30 million Indians died in a famine supervised by the British colonial overlords because the British colonial masters forced them to produce what was suitable to export for exports to Britain and abandon their traditional perennial crops that, that, the, that, the, that, the, that, the, that the peoples of India had survived for centuries, have survived on for centuries. Over in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Belgians were not any different. As colonial overlords, they forced the Congolese to produce for Belgium, for Brussels, and any man that did not meet up to the quota 
had his children's hands amputated. Such episodes well illustrate that food policy has often been, often been a fight between the interests of the rich and the poor. No wonder Karl Marx declared that food lay at the heart of all political structures. He went ahead to warn of an alliance of industry and capital intent on both controlling and distorting food production. Many of today's food debates can also be usefully reinterpreted when seen as part of a wider economic picture. For example, recent years have seen the co-option of the vegetarian movement in a political program that can have the effect of perversely disadvantaging small-scale traditional farming in favor of the large-scale industrial farming. This is part of a wider trend away from small and mid-sized producers towards industrial scale farming and a global food market in which food is manufactured from cheap ingredients both in a global bulk commodities market that is subject to fierce competition. Consider the launch of a whole new range of laboratory created fake meats fake dairy, fake eggs, fake shrimps, and what have you, in the US and Europe, often celebrated for aiding the rise of the vegan movement. Such trends entrench the shift of political power away from traditional farms and local markets towards biotech companies and multinationals. Some of the big corporates, of course, are Impossible Foods that produce plant-based beef, Beyond Burgers that also produce plant-based beef, Loma Linda that produces plant-based tuna called Tuno, New Wave Foods that produces plant-based shrimp from seaweed, Just Egg that produces plant-based egg in a squeeze bottle that can also scramble and tastes almost like egg and Unilever that has over 700 plant-based foods in its repertoire. Estimates for the global vegan food market now expected to grow each year by about 10% and to reach about $24 billion by 2026, which is about six years from now. Figures like this have encouraged large-scale agricultural industry operators to step in, having realized that the plant-based lifestyle generates large profit margins, adding value to cheap raw materials such as protein extracts, starches, and oils through ultra-processing. Ultra Of course, you know, it makes clear business sense for you to abandon real agriculture and produce um, um, very expensive fake meats, fake fish, fake shrimps from relatively cheap raw materials. Researchers at the US think tank Rethink X predict that we are at, on the cost of the fastest, deepest, most consequential disruption of agriculture in history. They say that by 2030, which is about 10 years from now, at the end of this decade, the entire U.S. dairy and cattle industry would have, would have collapsed as precision fermentation, producing animal proteins more efficiently via microbes, disrupts food production as we know it. Although people in the West might think that this is a price worth paying, elsewhere in Africa and across the developing world, it's an entirely different kettle of fish. While there is much to be said for rebalancing Western diets away from meat and towards fresh fruits and veggies, in much of Africa, India and other parts of the developing world, 
animal sourced foods are an indispensable part of maintaining health and obtaining food security, particularly for women and children and the 800 million poor people that subsist on starchy foods. I mean, I remember having a personal example where, a personal experience rather, where I found um, in a community thousands of hectares of what we call Bendel pineapple in Nigeria, fresh, organic. I rang out one of the big um, corporates that produce juices and I said, look, I have this cache of very, you know, uh, very uh, well-grown um, pineapples. Can we, can, can we supply you? And the response from the organization was, we don't use any of those to produce our juices. So, of course, if they don't produce juices from um, fresh pineapples, they produce, they probably produce from synthetic with a lot of additives. To me, the 2050 challenges for quality protein and some of the most problematic micronutrients worldwide, especially in the continent, across the continent of Africa, animal source foods remain key. But livestock also plays a critical role in reducing poverty, increasing gender equity, and improving livelihoods. Animal husbandry cannot be taken out of the equation across most of Africa, where plant agriculture involves manure, traction, waste recycling, and so on, if the land allows sustainable crop growth in the first place. Traditional livestock gets people through very difficult seasons, prevents malnutrition in impoverished communities, and provides economic security. Imagine places across the, you know, in, 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 at the, in the Horn of Africa, that is you know, that has protracted um, problems with drought and so on and so forth in Sudan, in Nigeria, you know, for across most of Kenya, Zimbabwe, you know, where livestock produce some kind of insurance for people at the bottom of the pyramid. So, the bottom line is that the food wars we see and the introduction of lab-grown meat and plant-based food is for the money. Across Africa, food wars are seen in sharp relief as industrial-scale farming by transnationals, multinationals, for crops and veggies takes fertile land away from mixed family farms, including cattle and dairy, and exacerbates social inequality in its wake. The result is that today, private interest and political prejudices often hide behind the grandest talk of ethical diets and planetary sustainability, even as the consequences may be nutritional deficiencies, biodiversity destroying monocultures, and the erosion of food sovereignty. For all the smooth talk Global food policy is really an alliance of industry and capital intent on both controlling and distorting food production. We should recall Marx's warnings against allowing the interests of corporations and private profit to decide what we should eat. Let me close with a quote by Toby Amido, a renowned dietitian and nutrition expert. I quote, it is nice to have both animal and plant-based options, but just because it is plant-based doesn't mean it is necessarily healthier. One of the biggest issues with plant-based alternatives is the massive amount of ingredients listed on the label, including numerous additives. In addition, the plant-based alternatives don't usually have the same list of nutrients compared to its animal alternative and 
quote. So there you have it.